opposed say no. In the apparent opinion of the chair, the <laughs> ayes have it. Uh, the amendment is adopted. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Connecticut rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. DeLauro of Connecticut. Page 2, line 14, after the aggregate dollar amount, insert reduced by $200,000. Page 3, line 4, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $300,000. Page 3, line 10, after the dollar I amount, ask insert... I the that the amendment be accepted as read. Is there an objection? Without objection? So ordered. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. My amendment uh, will transfer one million... <clears throat> dollars to the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, the funding would come from the U.S. Department of Administ uh, Administration, uh, from uh, several of the administrative accounts, Office of the Secretary, the Chief Economist, Budget and Program Analysis, Chief Information Officer, Office of Communications, and General Counsel. The intent is that it will be used to protect the American public from E. coli sickness originating from FDA-regulated foods. This is something we have to do. Our primary responsibility as the people's representatives is to protect the health and safety of American families, and the current funding level for the FDA in this bill puts these at risk. We know that foodborne illnesses are always a major public health threat. They account for roughly 48 million illnesses, 100,000 hospitalizations, and over 3,000 deaths in our country each year. Put another way, one in every six Americans becomes sick from the very food they eat each year. Specific to E. coli, well over 200,000 sicknesses every year are because of this one type of foodborne bacterial sickness. And the threat of a more serious outbreak is, always very, is all, also very real. Right now in Europe, we are witnessing just such a lethal outbreak. In Germany, thousands have been affected, hundreds have become sick, and 37 have died from an E. coli outbreak. Just this morning, a two-year-old German boy perished from kidney failure as a result of E. coli poisoning, which authorities think began with raw bean sprouts in northern Germany. This sort of fatal outbreak could all too easily happen here. In many ways, we have been extraordinarily lucky that it has not happened more often. In recent years, all types of food have become contaminated and forced into recall, from Fruit Loops to SpaghettiOs and salami to eggs. We have to be continually vigilant on the food safety front to keep families safe. That is also why we passed the Food Safety Modernization Act last year to give FDA the tools to better respond to foodborne illness outbreaks and to hold industrial food production facilities to higher standards. But for no budgetary purpose to speak of, this legislation would undo all of these overdue and much-needed improvements. In so doing, it effectively ties the hands of the FDA, ensures it will not have the funding to implement or enforce the Food Safety Modernization Act, or to fulfill its mandate to guard against contaminated foods. Once again, we will be stuck with the status quo, and that status quo means that people will continue to become sick and people may die. With so much food coming in from overseas, we should be improving our food safety system right now. For example, the GAO recently issued a report highlighting the shortcomings in our ability to ensure the safety of imported seafood. I urge my colleagues to vote for this amendment to restore $1 million in funding to food safety efforts at the FDA. We should be doing more, not less, to keep our fridges and our kitchen tables safe. Does the gentlelady yield back her time? Yield back. Gentlelady yields back her time. <coughs> For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida rise? Georgia. 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 To rise in opposition of this, and I wanted to say The gentleman that, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, food safety is something that we all have placed a very high priority on and we're very concerned about, and we have been watching this situation in Europe daily as we're all concerned and our prayers are with the people who have suffered and those who have died, I do want to um, read a quote that uh, Secretary USDA, Mr. Vilsack, said yesterday, um, and I'll just quote, uh, uh, Secretary Tom Vilsack said he is reasonably confident that the U.S. consumers won't face the same sort of E. coli outbreak 
now plaguing Germany. And, you know, we're doing a, a lot and have done a lot in the last 15 years to make sure that um, we address potential E. coli infection. Um, for example, the uh, the type of ground beef that has had a, a repeated problem with it has actually been cut in half, and I will uh, put that into the record. Also, I want to say I do have concerns about the FDA implementation of food safety. Um, we hear quite often that 48 million people have suffered from foodborne illnesses, very high number, a number that we're all very concerned about. Um, but only 20% of these are from known pathogens. If you, do, if you look at it even further, 60% uh, of the illnesses from known pathogens come from uh, norovirus. And how do we address this? Well, CDC said on March 4th to update the norovirus the appropriate hand hygiene is the likely most single important method to prevent norovirus infection and control transmission. Reducing any norovirus present on hands is accomplished by thorough hand washing with running water and plain antiseptic soap. Now in FDA's 630 page budget request, there was not one single mention of norovirus. I would, I would ask anybody, isn't that odd to you? That's something we need to be concerned about. Why would they not mention that if nearly 60% of the illnesses are from norovirus? Second highest cause of illness is from salmonella. And under the authority that FDA had before the Food Safety Modernization Act and the authority that the FDA has right now, they finalized the salmonella egg rule in July of last year, almost a year ago. According to FDA's own press release, FDA said that as many as 79,000 illnesses and 30 deaths due to consumption of eggs contaminated with salmonella may be avoided each year with new food safety requirements. They have that authority right now, and that was last year's budget. They can still do it this year with this budget. The third highest cause of foodborne illness comes from Clostridium. In Clostridium, um, there is mentioned one time in FDA's 2012 budget request as it was related to food defense. And the reason why this is important is because the FDA is always seems to be ready to take on new initiatives, and yet it doesn't seem to be tackling the food safety challenges that we have right now in an orderly fashion under its current budget. Now the CDC statistics, which we got through hearings, goes back to that 48 million foodborne illnesses a year, 128,000 hospitalizations and 3,000 deaths. Very high numbers, numbers that we're all concerned about. But if you look at 311 million Americans eating three meals a day, that would be 933 million meals eaten each daily or 340 billion eaten each year. If you do the math on this, the food safety rate is 99.9% .9 safe. Why is that relevant? Because something's working without the FDA and without the USDA and without the nanny state saying we're in charge of everything. And that's called the private sector. And the private sector is a dirty word for many people in Washington, D.C., but food processing companies are very concerned about food safety and their customers' safety because the way you keep your customers coming back to buy more is to keep them happy. And that means to keep them safe. And it would be hard for me to believe that some of the leading companies in America, such as McDonald or Burger King or Coca-Cola, have anything on their mind except for food safety. And so I, wanted to, I, I appreciate the gentlewoman offering this amendment, but it's only a million dollars. And if it was a serious amendment, certainly it would be more than that. But based on what we've seen so far, I don't but think this amendment yield. is going to do anything. Without, this time has expired. The gentleman yields back.
The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Connecticut. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not On agreed that I to. ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Connecticut will be postponed. Mr. Chairman. What purpose does the gentlelady from Texas rise? I have an amendment at the desk, amendment number 156. Uh, the clerk will report the uh, amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas, page 2, line 14, after the dollar figure, insert increase by $25 million. Page 5, line 5, after the dollar figure, insert reduced by $25 million. Okay. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? I serve a point of order on the gentlewoman's amendment. Point of order is reserved. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for five minutes. I uh, thank the distinguished chairman and I uh, also thank the distinguished chairman from Georgia who I'm hoping will be inclined to recognize the importance of this amendment uh, and uh, work with those of us who are interested in healthy foods. Mr. Chairman, uh, my amendment would fund and seek to have the Secretary of Agriculture focus on the Healthy Food Funding Initiative. Uh, this initiative would increase the availability of affordable healthy foods in underserved urban and rural areas and as well uh, particularly uh, through the development of equipment of grocery stores and other healthy food retailers. We call these food deserts and the reason why I'm standing next to this tragic picture of the disasters that have hit the American public is to emphasize what Americans go through. In this instance, we see a disaster of unbelievable proportion from Missouri to Alabama to the flooding that occurred up and down the Mississippi. I can assure you that these individuals are suffering from the lack of access to healthy food. We've got to get them back on their feet. And this idea of food deserts impacts rural and urban areas, but it also impacts the millions of Americans, thousands upon thousands of Americans, who have recently been impacted by disaster. Everything is gone. And although they are now probably experiencing the distribution of food from food centers sponsored by FEMA and volunteers, they will come back to a food desert. Particularly in the African-American and Hispanic communities, for example, food comes from fast foods and convenience stores. And as I indicated before, those fast foods uh, come from, if you will, uh, the uh, places where the expiration date are sometimes way over of the time of expiration. According to the Center for De Disease Control and Prevention, 80% of black women and 67% of black men are overweight. African-American children from low-income families have a much higher risk for obesity. Why? Because there is no access or limited access to good food. The CDC also estimates that African-American and Mexican-American adolescents aged 12 to 19 are more likely to be overweight at 21% and 23% respectively. This amount of money will allow us to focus on the importance of correcting food deserts. The U.S. Department of Agriculture identified 92 food desert census tracts in Harris County alone, and that is in the 18th Congressional District. These areas are subdivisions of the county with between 1,000 to 8,000 low-income residents, with 33 percent of the people living more than a mile from a grocery store. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, 32 percent of all children in Texas are overweight or obese. These statistics underscore the staggering effect food deserts have. I am asking that we look at the idea of ensuring healthy food. Targeting federal financial assistance to food desert areas through the Healthy Food Funding Initiative will provide more healthy food to affected neighborhoods. We can create jobs, we can help farmers, and we can bolster the development in distressed areas. It is an easy fix, and the fix is to find a way to cooperate, collaborate, not do a handout, not dole out, to make sure that we provide the incentives to come into our areas to ensure that we have a healthy child. This is a healthy child, we hope. 
getting access to health care, but I can assure you that the health is based upon not only health care, but the food that this little one will eat. I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, that I live in communities that have the inability to access good food. This initiative will increase the availability of healthy food alternatives to the 23.5 million people living in food deserts nationwide. We must be reducing the deficit, I agree, but cutting programs that provide healthy food and create jobs, because it would certainly create jobs by adding access to healthy food and sites for healthy food, meaning grocery stores, farmers markets, all of those will be part of this initiative, and it would assist the many, many census tracts in Houston alone that are now suffering from the lack of access to good food. Just a picture of green vegetables inspires us to support this amendment. I'd ask my colleagues to support this amendment, and with that, I yield back my time. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. Chairman, I moved to strike the last word, and I wanted to object to this and explain the point of order. The, um, the gentleman will suspend. Does the gentleman continue to reserve his point of order? I continue to reserve. And the, the gentleman is recognized. The reason is that the amendment may not be considered on block under Clause 2F of Rule 21 because the amendment proposes to increase the level of funding and outlays in the bill. And under the House rule, the amendment has to be budget neutral with budget authority and with outlays. And this only does one of those. And I know the gentlewoman has worked very hard on this, and that was the intent. But, it, but because the budget authority and the outlay both have to be considered, that's what the problem is under Rule 21. I know the gentlewoman is an expert in this, has put a lot of time and a lot of compassion in it, and it's something that the committee is not uh, turning our back on at all, but that's why we're objecting to it. And I know that my friend from Houston is very passionate on this and will be back again doing other things to try to make sure that we address food deserts and so forth. And, and I appreciate her conviction on that, and I, I wanted to explain that. Any uh, other member wish to be heard on the point of order? I would, Mr. Uh, the gentlelady from Chairman. Texas is recognized. Uh, first of all, let me thank the uh, ranking member, Mr. Farr, as well, and his staff for recognizing the importance of food deserts. And let me thank Mr. Kingston, if I might. Um, I would, would offer, uh, out of your uh, thoughtfulness, I would even ask for the point of order to be waived uh, in the face of 23.5 million individuals who live in food deserts. What I would to make the argument in speaking to uh, the uh, point of order, uh, and particularly procedurally, of course, uh, is that uh, you know it was a challenge uh, to be able to frame uh, language uh, that would allow us to address this crisis. Uh, and so uh, I believe we made every effort uh, to ensure that we were in compliance. Uh, it is my understanding that the language or funding for this initiative uh, was not in this legislation or pulled. We wanted to give the discretion to the Office of the Secretary to not leave places like this uh, that I just lifted up, disasters now suffering from not having access to food. I'd simply uh, ask the gentleman uh, in this moment when I'm asking for a waiver of the point of order to have the ability to work with this uh, great uh, subcommittee to think of this as a valuable issue uh, and to work on this point uh, that has to do with helping those who live in food deserts. I yield to the gentleman. Um, I, I reluctantly have to insist on the point of order. It's actually scored CBO $5 million, and that um, is beyond my authority to waive anything. And it's not a numerical thing, it's just the rule. Do you have an interest in working if together? The if the gentleman will suspend. Let me say, we'll, there any other member we'll see what, what we can do. I'm not fully versed on it, but um, the gentlewoman knows that the door is always open to my office and we'll continue to work with you, but I do have to insist on the point. It's prepared to rule uh, on the matter. To be considered in block pursuant to Clause 2F of Rule 21, an amendment must not propose to increase the levels of budget authority or outlays in the bill. 
Because the amendment offered by Gentlewoman from Texas proposes a net increase in the level of outlays in the bill, as argued by the Chairman of the Subcommittee on Appropriations, it may not avail itself a Clause 2F to address portions of the bill not yet read. The point of order is therefore sustained. The amendment is not in order. The clerk will read. Page 2, line 18, Office of Tribal Relations, $423,000. Executive Operations, Office of the Chief Economist, $10 the million. The clerk will suspend. For what purpose does the gentleman rise? Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. We have not yet reached that point in the reading. The, gentleman, the clerk will continue to read. Executive Operations, Office of the Chief Economist, $10,707,000. National Appeals Division, $12,091,000. Office of Budget and Program Analysis, $8,004,000. Office of Homeland Security, $1,272,000. Office of Adv Advocacy and Outreach, $1,209,000. Office of the Chief Information Officer, $35 million. Mr. Chairman. The clerk will suspend. For what purpose does the gentleman rise? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Fortenberry of Nebraska, page 3, line 19. Insert after the dollar amount the following, reduced by $1 million. Page 39, line 10. Insert after the dollar amount the following, increased by $1 million. The gentleman is recognized. The gentleman from Nebraska is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin the discussion on the amendment, I'd like to correct the record in regards to something I said earlier. The CFTC budget is actually decreased by a slightly higher amount than the overall ag budget, rather than a slightly lower amount. In addition to that, I, I do wish to address a number of charges laid before uh, the chairman of the Ag Appropriation Committee. We've heard for hours that this bill is about supporting Wall Street, big oil, and tax breaks at the expense of food security. I think it's very important to note that food security is an important American value. It's important to me. It's important to many of us. So much so that in a time of very tight budgets, this bill actually raises food and nutrition spending by nearly $7 billion, approximately 7% more than current levels, because there are many vulnerable Americans out there who now qualify during these very tight economic times. Secondly, I also wish to reiterate, I did not support the Wall Street bailouts. Many of us didn't, both Democrat and Republicans. Five banks now control more than 50% of the deposited assets in this country. Main Street banks, many of whom had no role in the reckless behavior on Wall Street, are now under the constant competitive pressure from those banks that were deemed too big to fail, but in actuality are too big to succeed. Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to point out that I did not vote for the tax deal passed at the end of, the, of last year, an 11th hour deal that was cobbled together because of the mismanagement of this institution, institutional process. We could have done much better for the American people, both Democrats and Republicans. So the reality is, this is a very difficult process we're in now to right-size our budget and gut make government more efficient and effective. In that regard, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, have, uh, to offer an amendment that invests in renewable energy in rural America. Clearly, America needs a bold new energy vision, and this amendment, I believe, can help. A sustainable energy future must include the integration of conservation and new technologies powered by clean, renewable sources such as wind and solar, geothermal, biofuels, and biomass. Increasing our energy portfolio and the diverse range of opportunities available to produce energy domestically is all the more important in light of skyrocketing fuel prices. Rural America should continue to play an important role in this regard. Specifically, Mr. Chairman, my amendment would transfer $1 million from the United States Department of Agriculture Office of the Chief Information Officer to the Rural Energy for America program, also known as REAP. While I recognize the importance of funding for the Office of the Chief Information Officer and its role in providing enhanced technology for the USDA, I believe it is appropriate to transfer a small amount by federal standards, $1 million, to our nation's renewable energy efforts. The REAP program funds a wide range of renewable energy projects that stimulate rural economies, help create jobs, and address environmental concerns. 
This funding promotes energy efficiency and rural energy production, renewable energy production, and is directed to farming communities and rural small businesses. Mr. Chairman, renewable energy is changing today's agriculture and rural communities. It is clearly in our national interest to help rural communities, communities integrate a wide variety of renewable energy sources and technology as we move toward energy independence and environmental security. New development and signs of interest in renewable energy production are booming, Mr. Chairman. This amendment strengthens Congress's resolve to creatively develop new energy options throughout America, and I urge its adoption. I want to also thank my colleague from Minnesota, Mr. Walsh, for his support of this amendment, a native son of Nebraska. That I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Well, for what purposes is the gentleman from Georgia? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman will suspend. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? Mr. Chairman, move to strike the last word. We do accept the Chairman, the this gentleman amendment. is recognized for five minutes. We, we accept the amendment with reservations. I want to say to my friend from Nebraska, he's been working very hard on this amendment, particularly in the last five hours. But we had a debate about this in full committee. Ms. Kaptur offered an amendment that restored funding for the REAP account. It was my intention to zero it out because I do want to reduce the number of federal programs that are out there. The full committee did restore, uh, restore it. I'm not sure what $2 million in that account will do. I do support renewable energy but I will say that there are dozens of programs and dozens of research channels available to people for renewable energy, um, particularly in the rural area. So I want to say to my friend from Nebraska and from Minnesota that um, we'll accept the amendment, but you, better, you need to keep your eye on us <laughs> because it's not a program I particularly like. And, uh, but, and I, I, I'm very serious about eliminating as many programs as possible, so we need to continue talking about that. So that I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Georgia, first of all, for, uh, for his generosity to us, and we certainly understand uh, the position you're coming from. And I. Uh, I, I think, yes, it's, it's probably a, a small amount of money, but I think all of us recognize, too, the need to, uh, uh, to send a strong, clear signal, uh, the importance of these programs to the Senate, and let them take a look at it over there. So with that, uh, I do rise in support of the gentleman's amendment. I want to thank my colleague from, uh, from Nebraska for, uh, for his hard work on behalf of all rural communities. I, uh, I certainly urge uh, support of this amendment. It restores a million dollars to the REAP program. And the gentleman's right, it is a small amount, but it, these are important programs. And I'd like to uh, also uh, thank Ms. Kaptur from Ohio for putting that back in this program. REAP's vitally important for rural communities. Farmers and rural small businesses in my district use REAP grants and loan guarantees to cut their energy bills and improve energy efficiencies. REAP allows farmers and uh, small businesses to help move our country to cleaner energy future by building wind, solar, biomass, anaerobic digester, geothermal, and cutting-edge technologies that were funded by this. Um, I, I think all of us recognize it's far better for us, Mr. Chairman, to, uh, to get our energy needs and control our energy future from here at home instead of putting our national security, our energy security, in the hands of, uh, of countries that don't like us. We spend $400 billion a year on imported oils from countries that hate us. They'll hate us for free. We can keep the money at home through programs like this, investing in diversity that keeps the jobs at home. And uh, I uh, want to say that I've seen this through the, uh, the energy manufacturing supply chain in my district, that the spinoff from these jobs in the private sector uh, is incredibly valuable. Uh, unfortunately, while I think this piece of amendment is, is a good one, uh, the underlying bill I don't believe that uh, reflects the priorities of rural America. Our farmers and ranchers clearly understand that we've got to tighten our belts, cut our budgets, and become more efficient. I simply think this piece of legislation puts a disproportionate burden on those that are doing so much for this country. 25% cut over the FY10 bill uh, is, is irresponsible. It, in fact, I would argue that it, it doesn't ensure if the safety net's there, that abundant, 
safe and affordable food supply that we keep talking about will be put in jeopardy. This bill decimates Farm Bill Conservation Program, takes money from proven nutrition programs, and strips, as you heard for the previous three hours, uh, the CFTC of its critical resources needed to regulate irresponsible behavior. For that reason, I'm going to have a difficult time supporting the overall bill, but I do believe the REAP program does give America a way to move towards energy independence. I've seen these programs that have worked in my district. Uh, I believe it lets us take control of our energy future, lets our farmers and ranchers be part of the solution, and let us, uh, lets us get back on the track to prosperity. So I want to thank the gentleman from Nebraska for his work on this and other issues in rural America, and I truly do thank the gentleman from Georgia for, uh, for indulging us and for, for hearing this and letting us put it forward. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Oh, yeah. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Nebraska. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The clerk will read. Page 3, line 20. Office of the Chief Financial Officer. Five million three hundred. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment dollars. at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Sessions of Texas, page 3, beginning line 22, strike the proviso relating to FAIR Act or circular A-76F activities. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, uh, know that the uh, federal government employs some two million executive branch, non-postal, full-time, and permanent employees. 850,000 of these employees hold jobs that are commercial in nature. Of the 850,000 commercial jobs, only a handful have been characterized as government employees or private sector workers who can perform these activities more efficiently and more cost effectively. My amendment strikes the current insourcing language found in this legislation, which, as drafted, would prevent the funds spent by this bill from being used to conduct public private competitions or to direct A76 conversions for any program, project, or activity within the United States Department of Agriculture without a contracting report to Congress by the Secretary. Two weeks ago, the House voted in favor of striking similar problematic anti-competitive A76 language from H.R. 2017, the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. The same change and reversal of bad, bad, bad policy, which I undertook at that time, should also be implemented in this legislation by striking this anti-competitive free market language. The A76 process provides a valuable option for taxpayers and requires real competition. A former assistant director at USDA, Sean Kingsbury, managed information technology programs at the department. Mr. Kingsbury, in his tenure, implemented A76 by transitioning to the first performance-based project management organization within the USDA, and it resulted in over $100 million in savings. Without, without the ability to add competitive insourcing, uh, ballooning deficits and out-of-control spending will continue in our government. It is time that Congress explores and gives all solutions to save taxpayers and the managers of the business of the government their hard-earned money. The Heritage Foundation has reported that subjecting federal employee positions, which are commercial in nature, to a public-private cost comparison will generate on average a 30 percent cost savings regardless of, of who wins that competition. Rather than preventing market competition that would improve service and lower cost, we should be encouraging agencies to find the best way to deliver services to citizens of this great nation. The role of government should be to govern, not to operate businesses with inside the government. Our nation's unemployment rate stands at 9.1 percent. We must allow the private sector the ability to create jobs without an un fair disadvantage. We must get more money for, we must get more results for our money. I urge all my colleagues to, to support this common sense taxpayer first amendment and to ensure cost savings competition is available to the managers within this agency. Congress should be looking 
to use all the tools that it can find to help save taxpayer dollars, and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Claim time in opposition. Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I rise in opposition to this bill, primarily because if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Uh, this has been a law for a long time. It allows our committee and, and, uh, and, and the public to know uh, what the uh, A76 circular review did. Uh, the report is on the department's contracting out policies and its budget for contracting out. That information which Congress has been getting year after year without any problems. The language has been in the bill for many years. And always, we've always received the report allowing uh, the contracting out activities to proceed. It hasn't stopped anything. The language specifically requires a report to go to the authorizing committee uh, reflecting the agreement reached with the uh, former Republican chairman of the Oversight Committee many years ago. It was his amendment that, that uh, did this. I have to say personally, too, that I've done the A-76 uh, circular contracting out. We have a military base in my community, the Defense Language Institute, and uh, the city of Monterey surrounds it. And we ended up with an A-76 uh, review, uh, ended up where the city could provide the, the base operation services much cheaper than the federal federal employees on the base, saving the Army about uh, $4 million a year uh, and having much better services delivered. So again, uh, uh, delivering this report to Congress seems to me uh, isn't, hasn't been a problem for anyone and it ain't broke, so I don't think we ought to support fi fixing it with Mr. Sessions' amendment. I'd urge a no Does vote. the gentleman yield back? Yield back. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Recorded vote. The gentleman is asked for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas will be postponed. All right. Continue reading. For line 5. Office of the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights, $760,000. Office of Civil Rights, $19,288,000. Office of the Assistant Secretary for Administration, $683,000. Agriculture Your Buildings... Clerk will suspend. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? I haven't actually read the book. I haven't gotten there yet. One second early, excuse me. Read a few more words. Yeah, the clerk will continue to read. Agriculture buildings and facilities and rental payments, including transfers of funds, $209,505,000. For what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? I rise, Mr. Chairman, because uh, I have an amendment at the desk. The, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Farr of California. Page 5, line 5, after we'll the dollar amount. the reading, please. Is there Requesting an objection? Without objection? The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm offering this amendment to move funding from the Agricultural Buildings and Facilities and Rental Payments account and investing that money in the Organic Data Initiative. Organic agriculture is very important and it's a growing sector of our farm and ranch community that has continued to grow at double digit rate since Congress passed the uh, Organic uh, Act in 1990. The, uh, the office collects and disseminates data regarding organic agriculture through the Agricultural Marketing Service, the Economic Research Service, and the National Agricultural Statistics Service. The organics sector should have the same access to data available to all agriculture, a building block to a successful U.S. agricultural economy. As the industry surpasses $29 billion, this information is vital to maintain stable markets, create proper risk management tools, and negotiate equivalency agreements with foreign governments. It's imperative that we continue to collect the information gained by ODI. The AMS uh, collects organic prices and disseminates the data through the marketing news reports. NAS conducts uh, surveys and collects data used by the Census of Agriculture, for the Census of Agriculture. The IRS published a survey marketing U.S. organic foods, recent trends from farms to consumers in 2009, and continues to produce reports which use the data collected by AMS and NAS, 
NAFS, to, in addition to surveying Americans about their organic consumption patterns. This is, amendment is needed for the following reasons. The AMS needs to continue to expand organic price reporting services to more commodities and price points and distribute the data through market news, creating price stability. The NAS will be conducting more information on organic production in the next agricultural census. It is needed to understand the size of the organic industry and create risk management tools. ERS is continuing organic economic analysis and expanding to include economic or organic trade data needed in export uh, in expanded uh, export markets. The President's fiscal year budget 2012 requested $300,000 specifically for AMS to continue the collection and distribution of the data. Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment to continue the organic data initiative. Reserve a balance, re respond if yield back, yield back. I'm sorry. The gentleman yields back. Question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Ask for a recorded vote. The gentleman has requested a recorded vote pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18 for the proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. Mr. Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia rise? I have an amendment at the desk. The amendment, uh, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number eight, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Brown of Georgia. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment simply reduces by 10 percent the amount for agricultural buildings facilities and rental payments. My friend from Indiana, Mr. Burton, and I have partnered to bring this common sense amendment before the House, and I would like to thank him and his staff for their, all their hard work, and I ask you unanimous consent, Mr. Speaker, that we insert his written statement in the record at this point. Be covered by General Leave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we're in an economic and fiscal emergency. The federal government spends too much money. It is irresponsible and immoral to keep spending beyond our means. Not only do we need to reduce our deficit, but we need to begin to make an impact on eliminating the huge debt that has been accumulating over the last few years. I greatly appreciate the effort and difficult decisions that the Appropriations Committee must make. That said, we must continue to make meaningful cuts to show that the American people and the President that we are serious about controlling spending and serious about the future of our nation. I urge my colleagues to support this common sense amendment. Let's show the American people that we are serious about controlling spending and stopping the outrageous spending that has been going on here in Washington under Democrat as well as Republican leadership. And I encourage a yes vote on this amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Madam Chair, I, I uh, rise in opposition. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I normally wouldn't oppose this because uh, it cuts from the account that I just tried to cut from, but I only cut $300,000 to pay for something. Uh, this amendment cuts $20 million and pays for nothing. Uh, I, I just think that that's not very good proposition. We have an awful lot of facilities uh, that are around this country. I mean, agriculture is everywhere, in every single state and almost every congressional district. Uh, I happen to represent the leading agricultural state in, in the United States, California. And we grow some 40, 50 crops that no other state grows, in addition to hundreds and hundreds of other crops. So we need facilities out there. And I, I know this is an account that's easy to be offset. And, and as I said, I tackled it the same account myself. But since the gentleman opposed my amendment, I think it's only good quote pro quo that uh, I oppose his. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. 
Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. Uh, the, in the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Madam Speaker. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. I request a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia will be postponed. The clerk will read. Page 5, line 21. Hazardous materials management, including transfers of funds, $3,393,000. Departmental administration, including transfers of funds, $23,900,000. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman has two amendments. Would you um, clarify which amendment? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, this would be uh, amendment designated as Clark uh, number five. Uh, amends page six and page 46 of the bill. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Clark of Michigan Page 6, line 11, insert after the dollar amount the following, reduced by $5 million. Page 46, line 22, insert after the dollar amount the following, Madam increased Chair, by $5 million. For what purpose does the gentleman arise? I ask unanimous, unanimous consent to dispense with the reading requirement. Are there objections? The, the gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this amendment would restore $5 million to the Women, Infant, and Children Farmers Market Nutrition Program. And this would allow uh, low-income pregnant women, low-income women who have just given childbirth, uh, to purchase food from a farmer's market or directly from farmers uh, to benefit uh, their young infant children up to age five. Uh, this is very important in many areas around the country, especially in the area that I represent, the city of Detroit, where you don't really have that many uh, markets around. Uh, many times uh, families, uh, even young mothers, have to go to uh, gas stations and drug stores uh, just to purchase groceries. And that's not, un un that's not acceptable. That uh, really encourages uh, uh, poor eating habits, poor nutrition, and really uh, increases our health care costs that all of us as taxpayers uh, ultimately uh, bear. So I urge you to consider this amendment. Uh, it's a, a fair proposal. It's very cost effective. And it provides uh, low-income mothers and their children with good nutrition. And, you know, that's the best medicine uh, for health care. Uh, to help get uh, better nutrition to prevent you from uh, getting uh, sick. Uh, the other thing, too, throughout this entire debate on this budget, many of the speakers would say that those that benefit from these programs, low-income women, infant and children, really don't have a voice. So many of us here in Congress have to be their voice. Well, I'd like to say, though, that the people who have benefited from these programs do have a voice. Uh, my mother, Thelma Clark, was a single parent, and she raised me. She was a child of the Great Depression. And ironically, during the Great Depression, she uh, passed out in her school classroom because of malnutrition. It was during the 1930s, and times are very dire uh, in the city of Detroit. Well, you know, she was uh, experiencing tough economic times all the while I was growing up as a young kid, as a teenager. But she vowed what happened to her would never happen to me. So she provided me with all the food I wanted, great meals, uh, with groceries that she purchased with food stamps. It worked for our family. And I want to say this, not just about this amendment, but about the role of government. I think the reason why this country is so great, and I thank God that my dad immigrated to this country in the United States as opposed to another one. We're so great because we understand the value of pooling our tax dollars together to help each other. That makes this country stronger. It provides everyone, everyone with an equal opportunity 
That's what makes this country one of the most extraordinary in modern civilization. So I ask you for $5 million, let's give every child that same chance. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Um, I, oppose, I claim time and opposition. Someone's recognized for five and I minutes. want to ask my friend if he's planning to offer his other amendment. Do, do, don't you have another related amendment? Well, um, it, it relates to a different issue. It deals with food safety, and that comes right after this. It does um, amend page six as well. So you don't have anything else on this section of the bill? At least not dealing with this specific subject matter. I do have an amendment that amends this same page, page 6 and page 17, but that deals with uh, uh, reinstating funding on a food safety uh, bill. But you, you are taken from the same, same account twice. You know, let me uh, consult with our uh, staff here. And I, I wanted to explain to my friend about it. I'm uncertain about this current amendment, but that, that departmental account, as unglamorous as they are to all of us, has been cut about 15 percent, and then this cuts it, and then your food safety amendment will cut it as well. And so that's what my dilemma is at the moment. And, and I'm sure, I, I don't know if anybody over there has actually heard from the department. I'm assuming they're going to be against it, but. I also want to point out to my friend, one of the things that I think that our authorizing friends should do is combine this program with food stamps anyhow because there is duplication and overlap. Uh, Mr. Farr, I, I yield to you. Madam Chair, can I strike the last word? The gentleman from Georgia has the floor. Well, let me yield to you and then uh, if, uh, if I need some time, you yield to me yield and to I'll me. send my courier over to uh, consult with you. Can we suspend? The concern here is that uh, this amendment double dips in the same account. Yeah, what the hell are you doing? And um, maybe we can work something out here. Mr. Brown took money out of this account. The gentleman I took from money California out of this account. has been yielded time. Thank you. Um, Does the gentleman from Georgia wish to reclaim his time? I, I do, Madam Chair, and uh, wanted to say to Mr. Farr if I could yield time to uh, Mr. Uh, Hansen from Michigan. I think we're. Oh, Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark Mr. from Michigan has been yielded time by the gentleman from Georgia, and he has. One and a half minutes remaining. And, and, and actually, I want to say something. We were talking earlier about some of the overlaps in these federal food assistance programs. And to me, this is a case where this is a program where there's a lot of overlap with food stamps. And we should look at that, realizing that that's the authorizing committee's jurisdiction. There's not much I can do more than comment on it, but let me yield to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I would ask for a vote on this. The, does the gentleman that, from Georgia yield I would withdraw my objection, and we accept the amendment. The gentleman yields back. The question, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. 
The amendment is agreed to. The, for what purpose does the gentleman from Indiana rise? I rise today to offer a straightforward amendment to this agricultural appropriations bill. The, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Young of Indiana, page 6, line 11. Insert after the dollar amount the following. Reduced by $2,390,000. Page 80, line 2. Insert after the dollar amount the following. Increased by $2,390,000. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. This amendment is quite simple. The amendment would simply reduce by a modest 10 percent that part of the USDA's budget used for, quote, general administration and miscellaneous supplies, unquote. Now, this category of spending is so broadly defined that Washington bureaucrats could use this money as a sort of gift card for these general administration and miscellaneous expenses. My amendment would put over $2 million of the money back into the spending reserve account to reduce our federal deficit. And that, of course, will lead to lower future taxes, lower future interest rates, and thus a lower future unemployment rate. I was sent here by the great people of Indiana's 9th Congressional District to focus, like a laser, on creating jobs, to get our federal spending under control so that we can keep our tax burden low and that will serve to the benefit of businesses and all that work for them around our country. Since being sworn in on January 5th, that's been my mission. I know it's been the singular focus of many of my colleagues. So this simple amendment advances this mission by trimming more bureaucratic fat from Washington. And it signals to all job creators and to our financial markets that we in Congress are serious, very serious about cutting unnecessary spending wherever we can find it. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone wish to speak in opposition to the gentleman's amendment? The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Indiana. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The clerk agreed. The clerk will read. Page 6, line 21. Office of the Assistant Secretary for Congressional Relations, $3,289,000. Office of Communications, $8,058,000. Office of Inspector General, $80,000,000. Office of the General Counsel, $35,204,000. Office of the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, $760,000. Economic Research Service, $70 million. Madam Chair. Where is it? For what purpose does the gentleman from Utah rise? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. Page 8, line 15, after the first dollar amount, insert reduced by $43 million. Page 8, line 18, after the first dollar amount, insert... Madam Chair, I'd ask unanimous consent, sir. Is there objection? Without objection, the gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we combine, we, we, this amendment uh, deals with four, uh, really uh, three different uh, uh, services within the Department of Agriculture. The, the idea and the goal, the situation here is that uh, perhaps they could take a reduction in funding, not totally zero them out, um, and really look at these duplicative programs as being something that can be uh, ultimately unified over the course of the time. So my amendment simply drives down the cost of these uh, and the hope and desire is that they will uh, somehow unify uh, to do and accomplish uh, what these are, uh, uh, these duplicative services. This uh, relates to the Agricultural Research Service, the, uh, the Economic Research Service, and the National Agriculture Statistics Service. Now, the one other one that I would also point out that is, uh, is funded is the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, where we are not suggesting a reduction in the amount, but the 
overall goal here is to reduce the amount of the uh, expenditure here 50 percent from 2011 and 43 percent uh, from the current bill. I think this is common sense. We have to make uh, a difficult decisions. So we recognize the value that the Department of Agriculture brings. Uh, a lot of people rely upon these uh, types of statistics and information that is needed uh, so that we can make sure that we have the very best Department of Agriculture that we can. But in these tough and difficult economic times, it is imperative that we uh, uh, make difficult decisions, and sometimes that means we are looking at duplicative programs, uh, maybe scaling those back a little bit and refocusing the mission so that they can actually uh, do what matters most and prioritize their own mission. So if we think it is the financially responsible thing to do, and I would urge my colleagues to look closely at this and uh, urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this amendment. Yield the gentleman back yields back. For what purposes, gentleman from California, rise?